Hello everyone, this is the second video in this series on shock, and today I'll be discussing how to distinguish shock types from one another. The sole learning objective is to be able to identify the most likely shock type in an individual critically ill patient. Recognizing the type of shock present in a critically ill patient is sometimes easy and sometimes very challenging. There's a classical description of how to determine this based upon the central venous pressure systemic vascular resistance, and the cardiac output. Here's a table that's frequently reproduced in medical, surgical, and ICU textbooks. I'm not going to go through it line by line because unfortunately this description is completely impractical. CVP, which is generally considered synonymous with right atrial pressure, and which is an imperfect but acceptable surrogate for left ventricular preload, can be estimated at the bedside from examination of the jugular venous pressure, or JVP. However, there is no way to measure or even reliably estimate SVR or cardiac output without performing a relatively invasive procedure. That procedure is the bedside placement of a pulmonary artery catheter. This is a bedside procedure in which a catheter is inserted into either the jugular or subclavian, or less commonly femoral vein, and advanced up into the heart and into the pulmonary vasculature in order to measure intracardiac pressures directly. Here's what it looks like when the catheter is removed from the package. They are typically yellow in color, at least here in the US, with a number of different ports. One port is for transducing pressure in the right atrium, one for pressure in the pulmonary artery, and one is to inflate a tiny balloon in a distal branch of the pulmonary artery in order to measure something called the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is an estimate of left atrial pressure. There are also various techniques beyond the scope of this video that allow one to measure cardiac output with this catheter. Now, it would seem like a pulmonary artery catheter would be super advantageous when diagnosing the type of shock and monitoring response to treatment. After all, you could bowl some fluid or start a vasopressor and immediately see the hemodynamic response of the intervention. When I was a medical student and intern, it sometimes seemed like the majority of patients in the ICU had PA catheters at any given time. Unfortunately, when the outcome data was examined objectively and critically, pulmonary artery catheters did not prove to be as helpful as it seemed like they should be. Here are the results of a 2005 meta-analysis of 13 separate trials, including a total of 5,000 patients with shock who were randomized to a PA catheter or no PA catheter. Importantly, the trials had no specific protocols as to what the treating physicians did with the information that was provided by the PA catheter. As you can see, not only was there no improvement in mortality when all trials were examined together, only one of the 12 trials showed a benefit when looked at in isolation of the others, and that was the second smallest trial with only 70 patients. And when the length of hospitalization was looked at as well, the same conclusion was reached, that is, PA catheters provided no benefit. This was an extremely influential paper when JAMA published it, and rates of PA catheter placement dropped pretty quickly. By the time I was an attending physician in 2006, I was already noticing a significant decrease in their use. And in case the issue wasn't fully settled, an even more comprehensive 2013 Cochrane Review reached the same conclusions. But what was up with these findings? Why do PA catheters not seem to help patients with shock? Well, there is no shortage of opinions on that question, but here are the five of the most commonly cited answers. First, a clinical trial that looks at a diagnostic test may not show benefit if there is no standardized approach as to what they should do with the test result. Some physicians may not adequately understand PA catheter data. Physicians may be targeting the wrong hemodynamic parameters. For example, for a patient in septic shock, physicians might tinker with IV fluid delivery and vasopressors in order to maximize the SVR, but perhaps in septic shock, there is a different parameter that should be optimized instead. PA catheter data may bias physicians to initiate unnecessary and potentially harmful interventions they would otherwise not have considered. For example, if a patient was unexpectedly found to have a low cardiac output, a physician might start an inotrope or vasodilator, which the patient might not need, based solely on a single number, which may or may not be reliable. And finally, as you might imagine would be the case from blindly placing tubes and wires inside a patient's heart and pulmonary vasculature, the placement of a PA catheter carries non-negligible risk of morbidity and mortality from the procedure itself. Since most of these trials were conducted before the routine use of bedside ultrasound in line placements, 
they may be more likely to show benefit if repeated today. Now, none of these explanations mean that a PA catheter is never indicated. Those negative trials that were included in the meta-analysis include a diversity of patients in shock. There are almost certainly very carefully selected patients who do benefit from PA catheters. As just one example, patients with profound cardiogenic shock, in whom peripheral blood pressures are impossible to interpret without real-time knowledge of cardiac output, SVR, or wedge pressure. But these patients who benefit seem to be in the minority. So where does this leave us? Prescribing appropriate treatment for shock requires accurate classification of shock type. Classifying shock requires knowledge of hemodynamic parameters, which cannot be measured without an invasive PA catheter. But placement of a PA catheter in unselected patients does not improve outcomes. How do we reconcile that? Well, first, we can be much more selective of who receives PA catheters. But in addition, we need to find a way of classifying shock using techniques that are non-invasive and optimally, which are more reliable than reducing complex pathophysiology to just three numbers. The first thing we can do, which was already mentioned a few minutes ago, is to realize that the JVP, or jugular venous pressure, is a generally adequate substitute for the central venous pressure. This is because the right internal jugular vein is roughly oriented as a vertical column over the right atrium, and thus, the height of the dilation of the jugular vein as seen externally in the neck acts as a manometer which measures right atrial pressure in units of centimeters of water. We obviously can't identify the position of the right atrium in the body on routine physical exam. However, there is an anatomic relationship in adults in which the right atrium is assumed to lie 5 centimeters closer to the ground than the externally palpable sternal angle in all positions supine, fully upright, or at 30 to 45 degrees. Thus, in the conventional examination method, clinicians estimate the CVP by observing the neck at whatever angle the maximum height of the jugular venous pulsations are visible. They then add the vertical height of the JVP above the sternal angle to 5. The upper limit of normal for JVP is most commonly cited at 8 centimeters of water. Unfortunately, Recent literature has found that this method of measuring JVP systematically underestimates CVP. In addition, the degree of underestimation is more significant the higher the JVP is. In other words, if the JVP is above 8, the patient almost certainly has an elevated CVP. However, there are some patients with mildly to moderately elevated CVP who may have a JVP estimated by the conventional method at less than 8. Having said that, in shock, when trying to differentiate hypovolemic and distributive shock with their low CVPs from cardiogenic and obstructive shock with their very high CVPs, it's not common to find CVPs in the high normal to mildly elevated range. As a consequence, even if JVP systematically underestimates CVP, this should not significantly impact most assessments of shock. In addition to using JVP as a substitute for CVP, bedside ultrasound can also be used. In this case, we are interested in the appearance of the IVC. To see the IVC on ultrasound, place the probe in the subxiphoid area, also referred to as the subcostal area, and orient it vertically head to toe. You are looking for this view in which the relatively homogeneous structure on top is the liver and the dark diagonal line is the IVC. To ensure it's the IVC that you're looking at and not the aorta, you want to either be able to follow it up to the right atrium, or alternatively, use Doppler to demonstrate the direction and pulsatile nature of flow. Echocardiographic studies have shown a rough correlation between CVP and the maximum width of the IVC and its collapsibility with abrupt inspiration, replicated with a quick sniff. There are a few variations on this chart, but this is the one from the most recent guidelines of the American Society of Echocardiography which is also endorsed by the European Association of Echocardiography. If the IVC's maximum diameter is equal to or less than 2.1 centimeters, and it collapses more than 50% when the patient sniffs, the estimated CVP is 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury. If the IVC's max diameter is greater than 2.1, and it collapses less than 50% with sniff, the estimated CVP is 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury and either combination of findings which does not fit into one of those two categories suggests a CVP of 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury.
for example, a dilated but collapsing IBC, or a non-dilated and non-collapsing IBC. Here's an example from a patient with a CVP of 0 to 5. Notice that the IBC is not dilated and collapses with respiration. In case you're wondering, the IBC width can be manually measured using electronic calipers on the ultrasound machine. And here's an example from a patient with a CVP above 10. In this case, the IBC is dilated and not collapsing. One last substitute for CVP that's commonly used on the wards is the passive leg raise test. There are several variations of this test, most of which have not been rigorously studied. Here's one variation that has been studied. A patient is placed in 45 degrees and the blood pressure is checked at baseline. Then the head of the bed is lowered and the foot of the bed raised such that the legs are now elevated at 45 degrees. At some point between one and five minutes, the blood pressure is rechecked. A change in pulse pressure greater than or equal to 9% of the baseline is indicative of, quote, fluid responsiveness, which means the patient has a central venous pressure that is lower than optimal. The idea behind this test is that the veins of the legs can passively store a significant amount of blood when they are in the most dependent part of the body. When the legs are abruptly elevated, it's a similar effect to giving the patient a quick bolus of IV fluid. If LV preload is inappropriately low and cardiac output is starting off low, then the quick fluid bolus will increase preload and increase cardiac output. The reason for using the pulse pressure as the endpoint rather than the mean arterial pressure or systolic blood pressure, which is frankly more commonly used in practice, is that the pulse pressure is less likely to be confounded by positional changes in arterial vascular tone that are not directly related to preload. One trial of this maneuver found that as a predictor of fluid responsiveness, its sensitivity was 79%, and its specificity was 85%. Not great test characteristics, but better than a less informed guess in some circumstances. Let me move on to another bedside test. Subjective assessment of extremity temperature as a substitute for both SVR and cardiac output. Here's how this is thought to work. Systemic hypoperfusion leads to increased release of endogenous catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. These activate alpha-adrenergic receptors. In hypovolemic, cardiogenic, or obstructive shock, which are all characterized by high SBR and low cardiac output, the response to alpha-adrenergic activation is peripheral vasoconstriction. It's this peripheral vasoconstriction that is responsible for the high SBR seen in these conditions, which results in cool extremities by decreasing blood flow to them. In contrast, in distributive shock, in which the primary derangement is vasodilation, the peripheral vessels are unable to constrict. Thus, SVR remains low, and when low SVR is combined with high cardiac output, blood flow to the extremities is markedly increased, resulting in warmth. Please note that the subjective assessment of extremity skin temperature is not the same thing as an objective measurement of core body temperature. Thus, a patient could be febrile, but still with cool extremities. Now, as a consequence of this hypothesis, it's common practice to use subjective assessment of skin temperature of the extremities to qualitatively estimate SVR and cardiac output. However, the evidence supporting this practice is underwhelming, and if used, the skin temperature should only be a minor factor in the assessment of shock. One final bedside substitute for the PA catheter is ultrasound of the left ventricular systolic function as a substitute for cardiac output. Notice that I say a substitute and not a surrogate because cardiac output and LV systolic function don't necessarily trend the same direction in every patient. But this is still very helpful in identifying patients with cardiogenic shock who have reduced LV function and to lesser extent patients with septic and hypovolemic shock who generally have what appears to be increased LV function, also known as a hyperdynamic heart, on account of high levels of endogenous catecholamines. There are several different ultrasound or echocardiographic views you can use for assessment of LV function, but I find that the parasternal long axis view is probably the most commonly used. Place the ultrasound probe in an intercostal space just to the left of the midsternum and orient it to be parallel with the long axis of the heart. This is the view you are looking for. The various chambers shown here are first the one closest to the probe or the most anterior in the chest, which is the right ventricle. The large chamber just behind it is the left ventricle, 
The smaller chamber off to the side closer to the bottom is the left atrium. If you have a good view, there should be also two valves visible. The one between the LA and LV is obviously the mitral valve, which makes the one next to the mitral valve the aortic valve. When looking for normal LV contractility, there are a few general things to look for. The most obvious is that the apparent size of the chamber should change significantly between systole and diastole. Also, with a little practice, you should be able to see the septum thickening with each contraction. And finally, you could also look at the movement of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. It should move quite a bit, even coming close to touching the septum during diastole. So here is what normal LV function looks like. And here is a patient with decreased LV function, which suggests cardiogenic shock. And last, here is one with hyperdynamic LV function, which suggests septic or hypovolemic shock. Unless you've had many dozens of proctored or supervised echo exams, please do not attempt to assign a specific number or even numerical range to your subjective impression of LV function. Just report it qualitatively as normal, decreased, or hyperdynamic. It takes much practice, even for cardiologists, to be able to estimate ejection fraction from an echo image with sufficient accuracy and precision. And if you're wondering about what LV function looks like in obstructive shock, patients can have pretty much any degree of LV function, though it's often normal. Importantly, however, is that in suspected obstructive shock, you should not be as interested in using the ultrasound for looking at LV function, since you will instead be using it to look for pericardial effusion, pneumothorax, or RV dilation and dysfunction consistent with a massive pulmonary embolism. So now, let's go back to the chart that we started off with. This categorizes the shock type based upon CVP, SVR, and cardiac output and I said that this is not all that helpful in practice. But with everything that's just been discussed, we can create an alternative chart, one that is much more clinically useful. So in hypovolemic shock, the JVP is low, IVC on ultrasound is non-dilated and collapsing, passive leg raise increases pulse pressure, extremity temperature tends to be cold, and LV function on ultrasound tends to be hyperdynamic. What are some other findings in hypovolemic shock that can point towards the correct diagnosis? Well, more so than the other shock types, the history of present illness almost always suggests it. After all, the three most common causes of hypovolemic shock are trauma, GI hemorrhage, and massive diarrhea, none of which are usually unknown at the moment of presentation. Moving on to distributive shock, the JVP is also low, the IVC is also non-distended and collapsible, the pulse pressure increases with leg raise, and the LV is usually hyperdynamic. However, as much as it's a reliable finding, the temperature of the extremities is usually warm. I've used the word usually twice here to highlight that a non-insignificant portion of patients who are critically ill with septic shock develop a concurrent sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy that can be unrecognized. This is thought to be the consequence of elevated levels of circulating cytokines, but it may also be compounded by profound acidemia. So if you have a patient in whom you strongly suspect septic shock, never completely change your mind based solely on low LV function on ultrasound or cool extremities, but rather suspect more than one shock type may be occurring simultaneously. Other findings in distributive shock, specifically in the septic shock subtype, are fever, and alterations of the white blood cell count. In cardiogenic shock, JVP is elevated, IVC is typically dilated and non-collapsible, pulse pressure does not significantly change with leg raise, the extremities are cold, and LV function is low on ultrasound. Other notable findings in cardiogenic shock may include a history of CHF, the presence of an S3, or elevations of B-type natriuretic peptide and troponin. Finally, in obstructive shock, these tests can look very similar to those in cardiogenic shock, with the exception that the LV function most commonly looks normal. The key to diagnosing obstructive shock is looking for the other findings, many of which can be seen with bedside ultrasound, 
in addition to physical findings of a DVT, soft heart sounds suggestive of a pericardial effusion, and absent unilateral breath sounds suggestive of a pneumothorax. There are three more important principles related to the diagnosis of shock. First, not all patients with shock have hypotension, and not all hypotensive patients have shock. Consider this Venn diagram. Here in blue are those in shock, and in red are those with hypotension. Most patients with either find themselves here in the middle with both. However, there are occasional patients with cardiogenic shock with normal blood pressure on account of extremely elevated SVR from profound vasoconstriction. Also, as mentioned in the previous video, patients can have toxin-mediated shock from exposure to chemicals such as cyanide and carbon monoxide in which pressure tends to be normal until profound acidemia sets in. And who has hypotension without having shock? Occasional patients with end-stage but compensated cardiomyopathy, particularly those on robust medication regimens with afterload-reducing agents such as ACE inhibitors and hydralazine. And also patients with cirrhosis tend to become relatively hypotensive due to peripheral vasodilation, but because it develops very slowly, the autoregulatory systems in their organs adapt to accommodate lower systemic pressure, and these patients are usually asymptomatic. The second important principle is that determining the type of shock a patient is experiencing should never be based on just one parameter and optimally should incorporate as much data as possible. This is one of the most commonly cited reasons that PA catheters don't seem to help most patients in shock. Their doctors end up making important decisions based on a single number that the catheter measures instead of considering the entire clinical picture. The final important principle which was already mentioned briefly, is that more than one type of shock may coexist in the same patient. There are two particularly common examples. First is the combination of septic shock and hypovolemic shock. In sepsis, patients develop leaky capillary membranes, leading to extravasation of intravascular proteins into the extravascular space, which pulls fluid along with it. Also, patients with septic shock are typically ill for several days prior to their presentations to the hospital, during which time they will not have drank much fluid. Another common example of coexisting shock types is the aforementioned combo of septic shock and cardiogenic shock from a sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. That concludes this video on how to distinguish between the various shock types. The next video in this series will give a very general overview of how the treatment differs between those types.